a regular meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. The first item on our agenda is the roll call. Chairman Lynch? Present. Councillor Backer? Here. Councillor Fritz? Here. Councillor McGinty? Here. Councillor Moe? Here. Councillor Roberts? Present. Councillor Swift Kayata? Here. Student Representative Skylar Armstrong? Here. Student Representative Brian Flynn? Here. Manager McGovern? Here. Okay, and the next item is the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The next item is reports and correspondence. And are there any reports? Councilor Roberts. I guess mine's not so much a reporter as it is a uh, thank you to. Uh, well, three weeks ago, I think it was on Saturday, there was a fire up at the dump. Somebody was not real, wasn't thinking too well. They threw some hot ashes into the hopper, and uh, Harry and Bruce were up there and tried to get the hose out. The hose was broken, and Harry had enough presence of mind to run down quickly and pull the tractor out of the, out of the hopper and saved what could have been a, a massive amount of damage for the town. And I just wanted to mention that we get some pretty good employees in town and they do think quickly and, and uh, they ought to be acknowledged for that. And then the other thing I just wanted to mention for those of us uh, young enough to remember, it was 40 years ago today that the Beatles appeared on Ed Sullivan. So I've been celebrating all day. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jack. Are there any other reports? Councilor Fritz. I just wanted to mention what I think was a very successful uh, board and commission uh, orientation meeting that we had about a week and a half ago, and that was very largely due to the organizational skills of Deborah Lane. And um, we had a tremendous um, percent of the, the board members and commission members attending, which was very good, and, and also the support staff from the town for those boards. Um, and counselors and two school board members and uh, so I think it was a, a good uh, meeting. Um, I just wanted to mention the, if you aren't already aware of how good our website is, um, you can find out all about what these boards and commissions are doing, when their meetings are, where they meet, uh, minutes from the meetings and, and allow you to attend if you care to. But that website is CapeElizabeth.com. Thank you, Carol. Councillor Swift, Canada. Thank you. Um, I wanted to mention um, to the public, because these, this meeting was not on television, but we did have a meeting of the Finance Committee on January 22nd, and um, this was the first meeting of this year's Finance Committee. We, um, as a committee of the whole of Town Council, set expenditure targets for the municipal uh, side of the house of an increase of 5.8% and for the school department budget of plus 8.1%. And that 8.1% does include the uh, cost of the new building project. Um, this would give us an estimated tax rate increase of 12.46%. I want to stress that this is the beginning of the process. We have. Uh, been getting, we on the council have been getting input, emails, and some letters and calls from citizens with regard to the budget, and I encourage other people to become involved. We need more input. We would like to know uh, what you think about this increase and um, what services and programs you value most and what you uh, would like to see, uh, would see as less valuable and um, if we had to do some cutting of services, what you would be interested in doing. So I encourage input, please call or write or email us. Thank you. Thank you, Ann. Hey, uh, one other thing I wanted to mention, um, the Cape Elizabeth Democratic um, Party had its caucus yesterday and I mentioned that not to be partisan, but just to recognize the efforts of our town clerk, Jackie Coy, and her employees because and they have to work on the weekend on a Sunday afternoon and um, it was well attended and probably lasted a little longer than um, anybody planned so we appreciate those weekend hours that people put in in, in the furtherance of democracy so okay the next item oh I'm sorry <coughs> Councillor Mull and we 
might want to mention that uh, our town clerk is going to be going to the Cumberland County Republican Caucus, which comes up on the last Saturday of February, February 28th at the Southern Maine Community College at 12.30 p.m. Okay, thank, thank you. you. And that is that. <coughs> Excuse me, I just want to mention that the municipal election is coming up on Tuesday, May 4th. Papers will be available starting tomorrow. There are two council seats available and two school board seats available. And um, as I said, the papers are available tomorrow and they have to be back in my office by March 19th. Thank you. Thank you. I'll mark that date, Jackie. I, <laughs> it's been a privilege and a pleasure to serve and I, I do intend to take papers out and okay. run again. Okay, no further reports or correspondence. We will go to the town manager's report. Yeah, thank, thank you, Madam Chairman. A, a couple of different issues. Uh, first, on a, on a, a somber note, uh, one of our former counselors passed away in the funeral tomorrow, uh, James Murray. Uh, Jim was a, an extremely friendly person, very dedicated citizen resident of uh, Patricia Drive here, here in Cape Elizabeth. He was on the council back in the, the mid-1960s, but you know, has remained active in the community ever since. Uh, he, uh, you know, really a fine, fine gentleman for anyone that, that knew uh, that knew Jim. His, his, uh, he has a very nice wife, Marge, and also they have, they have four kids, uh, Jimmy, uh, Bobby, Joel, and Susan. Uh, a couple of them still live in the Cape Elizabeth area and, you know, all contribute greatly uh, to the community in different ways. And, you know, it's, there's certain families that, that you get to know and, uh, you know, I, I don't know of any finer family uh, than the particular Murrays. Uh, Jim was also known as always the other Jim Murray. Uh, he, uh, Jimmy Murray, the contractor, a good friend who passed away a year or so ago, uh, he was actually named Leland Murray. And Jim Murray always got, this Jim Murray always got the phone calls for Leland Murray. And, uh, you know, we, we need to be ever thankful for Jim for taking all those phone calls and dealing with all the questions about fireworks and other issues. Uh, I know if Billy Jordan was still on the council, uh, Billy and this Jim, actually Billy was friendly with both Jim Murrays, but uh, he was a particular friend as well of this Jim Murray, and uh, he, he's an individual who, who really be missed by a lot of people in the community, just a, a very fine gentleman. Mike, do you know when the funeral is? The funeral's tomorrow morning at 11 at St. Apollonius uh, here in Cape Elizabeth. I went to the wake earlier, and uh, it was a very, very large crowd. Uh, there this evening, so it was good to see so many people paying tribute to Jim and giving their, their best to the family. Uh, also, on a, on a different type of a, uh, a note, but equally uh, of concern as well, I should say, uh, I just read a story on the internet that Carol Pileski, uh, the main taxpayer action network, had their uh, petition certified and will be a vote in November uh, on uh, that tax cap proposal. Uh, Matt Sturgis recently did and uh, our assessor recently did analysis of its impact on Cape Elizabeth. And if we look at the current year's budget, it would re result in a uh, tax decrease to the citizens of, of $9 million. Uh, that's the equivalent of 39% uh, of the budget across the board. Uh, you know, it, it's, if you look at that on the school budget, if, you, you know, if it all was equal, that's uh, about $6 million. Uh, and about three million on the municipal budget. Uh, it would, you know, it's absolutely uh, very challenging consequences as a result of a 39% uh, reduction. With certain fixed costs, it's actually like, it's really almost equivalent to a 50% reduction. So, uh, you know, it'd be the equivalent of, of doing away with half the teachers or doubling the class size or, or whatever, and you know, untold effects. What I'd like to do is really to encourage the town council to. Uh, meet sometime in the near future, perhaps as a committee of the whole or perhaps a subcommittee, to begin to deal with the issues of how we ought to involve the community in, in uh, helping to understand the possible impact as well as in planning uh, in case this should pass next November because, again, if it does pass uh, a nine, well, you know, what, from the current year budget before we even look at next year's budget, uh, a $9 million reduction uh, would change local government as we know it, so. Uh, you didn't call on the students. I didn't know if they had anything. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, they, they usually 
Want to listen? Speak during city. Oh, okay, sorry. So one? you may go on. Oh, okay, thank you. Also wanted to mention, uh, talk about good employees, there's a couple of different things. Uh, first, I was away a few weeks ago and I actually didn't find out about it until about a week later, but our Cape Elizabeth Fire Department responded to a call of frozen pipes. It was a Saturday, probably two weeks ago, at Cape Elizabeth Methodist Church. And I actually just read in the, the church bulletin, which they sent to me, our church newsletter, that the, it, the church was planning a supper that evening. And the fire department not only went and helped to mop up and clean up and do what the things they do after Waterley, they then, noting that there was a church supper, offered to make available to the church the fire department's kitchen and meeting room. And uh, Jerry Murray in particular, as well as some of the other volunteers, actually you know, opened up the station. They had their, the, the supper went on as if there was no change except for the, the change of locale. And, you know, and in fact, you know, Peter Gleason, the deputy fire chief, said to me when I was discussing it with him, you know, some of the guys even went and started setting up at the tables in the fire station before anyone even asked them to do it. Mm -hmm. So you know, I think it says an awful lot about our volunteer firefighters, our called firefighters and those personnel that they were so quick to not only to, to deal with the immediate situation, but also to really help out and, you know, apparently uh, it was a good dean supper and uh, a good time was had by all. So it was a great thing to hear about our fire department and really how creative they were in really saving the day for, for that church. And I know that the Methodist Church really did appreciate it. Uh, finally, I uh, wanted to mention uh, we have an upcoming retirement here in the town hall. Uh, Naomi Tomney, who's been with us for 15 years as our uh, municipal agent responsible for all the reporting to the state of excises and car registration, as well as helping with all the other activities in the tax office, announced she'll be retiring February 25th. Uh, so we, we wish Naomi well and really uh, express thanks for all her, her service to the community. Uh, with her leaving, it's created a chain event, a, a chain of uh, events uh, in the town office in terms of moving positions. Uh, Jackie, our town clerk, uh, had mentioned to me on a number of occasions over the last year, I wished I had never left my old job. Uh, she, she missed seeing the uh, customers every day and. Yeah, when as the town clerk, she's she's situated right outside my office, and although I don't think it had anything to do with me, uh, she has, or, or the council, or the council, she has she has decided that she'd like to return to her old position as as deputy town clerk, and again uh, working over in the tax office and many things, and as a result of her indicating that, everyone else, and as a result of you know the change of Naomi leaving. It's, end, it's ended up that everyone in the tax office is changing their position. Uh, Terry Olson's been good enough to agree to move up to take Naomi's place. Uh, Debbie Bumps agreed to move into uh, what was Terry's position. And then uh, De uh, Jack is moving into a, a variation of Deb's position. And Debbie Lane, I was busy with construction manager interviews for the school department all day Friday. And she was handling all this on Friday as things were constantly changing. So appreciate her efforts on Friday, as well as the cooperation of everyone in the office, and, and Jackie as well for her service as clerk, uh, which will be continuing yes. for a little while. Uh, we're now advertising the position, but uh, this very disappointed to see her go. She was doing a, an exceptional job. And I really appreciate everything she has done, but, but I also understand that uh, that's what she wants to do. So uh, appreciate all her efforts and look forward to continuing to work with her in the years ahead. Well, I want to thank the council for putting up with me for this year and not knowing what I was doing. And <laughs> Manager McGovern and Assistant Manager Lane for allowing me to go back and do what I was happy doing for 15 years. Well, you've done a fine job, and I commented to Michael that in some ways this is also very good in that we've cross-trained everybody now. Yes. Everybody yes. can do everybody else's job, so um, that's a wonderful thing. And we'll miss you sitting here, yeah. but... I miss your cheery voice at the end of the song, too. Okay. Is that the end of your report, Mike? No, just finally wishing the superintendent of schools well. Yes. Uh, with everything else, that he uh, moves to Connecticut pretty quick. Uh, effective, so I, wanted, I don't want to prematurely make an announcement that he's leaving earlier than we think. But, uh, yeah. but I, I might add that makes it all the more important that you are involved in 
those meetings to review the um, contractors that are hired because the school is going to need the help of someone who's got some experience and they will be without a superintendent for some period of time. So we appreciate those efforts and the efforts of your staff as everybody continues to fill in for everyone else and pinch hit. So, and we also wish the superintendent well, I think. Okay. Now the next item on the agenda is the minutes of the meeting held January 12, 2004, and then we also have minutes for a meeting that was held on January 22, 2004. Councillor Swift Cattle. I move we accept the, meeting, uh, the minutes for the meetings of January 12th and January 22, 2004. Any discussion? Mm -hmm. Second. There was a second already, Councilor Fritz. Okay. All in favor? Seven zero. Okay. Now, next item is citizens' discussion of items not on the agenda. So, if there's anything that anyone would care to discuss that's not on the agenda, or if there's anything our high school representatives would like to bring to us, um, I would note there were a number of high school students at the caucus yesterday, and it's always great to see young people involved in public activities so okay I'm sure they will Meeting. be the and I'm Republican. sure they will be again I don't mean to be partisan I encourage that similar involvement um, let's see no one here to speak on any item not on the agenda so we will move right to item 950304 which is the public hearing and action on proposed changes to the traffic ordinance and uh, this was um, scheduled last month at our meeting so I will now open the public hearing if there is anyone here to discuss the changes to the traffic ordinance seeing none I will close the public hearing now would there be a motion from the ordinance committee perhaps on behalf of the ordinance committee, I move the adoption of the traffic regulations as submitted um, with, however, a couple of very minor changes. Okay. I'll second that. And if I could outline those two changes. On pages aren't numbered, but on 13-2-3, subparagraph O, which is at the bottom of one of the pages. <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> oh, where it reads on the westerly side of Preble Street? Yes. Um, this is, it, it, rather than a period at the end of that, there should be a semicolon and the word or added. Okay. That's noted. In 13-2-4, which is on the next page, subparagraph E, this is an item that was discussed last month, and there was a request by Perhaps Councillor Fritz, I, I don't remember who, had, had raised it, but I think Councillor Fritz raised the question as to whether the parking restrictions that we were putting in place here at the fire station, the police station, the library should be tempered somewhat to make it clear that the restrictions were to be in effect only during business hours at those respective buildings. Um, and I, I, I think that there was an intention that the language be revised in preparation for this hearing. Um, it wasn't revised in the packet, but I do have proposed change that I think would address Councilor okay. Fritz's concern from last month. Do you want to read that? Could you tell me the item number again? Um, 13 it's 13-2-4, mm -hmm. subparagraph E that starts out with the words, the parking spaces and areas potentially available. 
Um, what I would propose first is that the word potentially be stricken. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I was going to move to amend that, and yet um, it seems so trivial. Then in the third line of that, after the words, Thomas, after the reference to Thomas Memorial Library, I would propose adding the words during regular business hours at the respective buildings, comma. Can I ask any questions? Madam Chair? Yes. Um, business hours. I mean, at the police station, they're 24 hours, and at the fire station, wouldn't they be 24 hours also? Mm -hmm. I mean, I can see the library. Obviously, the library has a defined period it's open, but those two buildings are open 24 hours. So, that, nice would, so the, that would be their business. Through the chairman to Councilor Backer. I think you could accomplish the same thing by putting during regular library hours in, in the throwing that in the same place. That's fine okay. to do okay. that. You, you accomplish what you're trying Library. to accomplish. Okay. Councilor Roberts. Yes, thank you. I had a concern as well on the language on the all-terrain vehicles, and this draft does include the, gives the town the right to bring the all-terrain vehicles into the, uh, on any projects in where they typically would be uh, ruled ineligible. I was concerned that volunteer groups such as the Rotary Club or a parents group at the high school or a snowmobile club or whatever would not, with this language, be allowed to go in and, and, and do those volunteer projects. And obviously I don't want to see volunteers discouraged from doing work that's going to save the town money. Um, spoken with the town manager, it says he believes that the language in there that allows the town, by extension, would allow the, uh, these clubs to do that. And I just want to clear for the record that that was my intent and that, that others agree as well that that language does cover the volunteers going in as long as they have permission to do that. And I'm not seeing anybody stating the thing otherwise. Councilor Roberts, could I just clarify, you're talking about in section 13-3-8. Correct. That's Correct. right. Okay. Just for the record. So I, I don't see any need to amend it as long as everybody's comfortable with that and feel that that would allow volunteers to go in. Uh, as long as they had noted that they were going to do that particular project. Is, uh, Councilor McGinn. Oh, you want to talk about that? Well, I just, I had a question for the, the manager, which is, is that really clear enough? Now, when, when something as, it, as the current draft says, by the municipal government, you know, the municipal government includes, you know, our own forces, it includes privately paid forces, it includes volunteer forces, it includes anyone acting on behalf of the municipal government. It's not intended to be exclusive to simply municipal employees. Okay, well, I suppose if the record reflects that. Yeah, I, I think we're covered as long as this tape doesn't burn up. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Councilor McGinford. I had uh, one just minor uh, uh, typo on pay, uh, the definition 13-1-1, the very first uh, paragraph A, uh, it says, uh, goes on, that is self-propelled, but, but, I take out one of those buts, I think. <laughs> yeah. And um, include electronic personal assistive mobility devices, comma, motorized wheelchairs or vehicles. And that's the only one that I really picked out with the first paragraph. I had another issue, though, and that was with uh, Fort Williams, and that's way back uh, the next third to last page, the bottom. It's, uh, Are you in 13-6-6? Yes. B. B. And then. B. Okay. Um, it says the sole access to and egress from Fort Williams shall for vehicles shall be to the gated shore road opposite place at park. Um, then it goes on to mention, I think on the next page, except for special events, it talks about. Um, well, it doesn't, and I know for some special events we use other egress and. Um, access and egress. 
Wouldn't that be covered under C? Maybe I'm not understanding your point. It says all gated roads shall be closed to access by motor vehicles for travel, except for travel by municipal vehicles and equipment and or in connection with a special event when the gated areas are so signed. Oh, I see. Your point is that it's just that one entrance. Right. It, it doesn't. Sorry, I misunderstood. It you. doesn't. Those gated roads, or those roads that are already there, are kind of big chains really across from that gate per se. Um, but it doesn't say that any other gate can be used for access or um, egress, even during a special event, unless you want to interpret well, gated areas as the gate itself. But it says all gated roads shall be closed to access, right. Ex and then except. I understand Doesn't that. that well, you, you, I, you have the interior roads that are gated off, so people can't drive on those roads except for municipal employees, for people walk the dogs and things like mm -hmm. drive there. But it doesn't say that any other gate can be used to let people in or out of the, the fort. I, well, that's, I think it does, the way I read it, I think it does because it says all gated roads shall be closed to access by motor vehicles, excepting for travel, by municipal vehicles and equipment, and in connection with a special event. And and that's the way you're reading it. I just didn't I'm reading it, it to me that access. Okay. If, if that's the way you interpret it, that's fine. If that's the way the town manager interprets it. <laughs> okay. That was the only thing. Okay. Councilor Mould? I just I was going to say I read it the same way John does, and that you may want to, it's not a big deal to me, but you may want to throw an extra caveat into section B as in, as in referring to that, that next section, because it does say the sole access. Would, okay. You should probably throw a word in there, except for special events or something like that. Would it help to say under B, instead of the sole access to, it's just the regular access to an egress from Fort Williams Park? Or regular that event, or another option for B might even be to say, except as provided in paragraph C. Yeah. Which is a good point. That would work just thinking. fine, I think. Okay. Which then becomes paragraph two, right? No, it's still two disappears. No, it's, it's, well, it's not still, still reference. Reference. Oh, one oh, and two, yeah. All right, C. Okay. Um, our, I think we can vote on this with all of the amendments that have been raised. Do we need to go through them, Jackie, or do you think we're... Okay, great. We're all set. So, is there further discussion? Um, could I have clarification as to what we've done with um, the reference to the library hours? I thought how that no. my understanding was we would say um, and the Thomas Memorial Library during regular library hours at PMO because otherwise you're going to say all three of those during regular library hours which make sense. Well, I, yeah. can we just break it into two sentences I think it would be a lot more clear and say parking spaces and areas available for parking at the town center fire station and the Cape Elizabeth police station may be used only in conjunction with activities in those buildings, period. And another sentence that says the parking spaces and areas available for parking at the Thomas Memorial Library may be used only in, only in connection with activities at the library during, during regular during business library hours. or during okay. regular library hours. Okay. Well, but if you have an event at the library that's outside of regular hours, there are evening events that are occasionally held at the library. I, mean, well, I, don't, I, I really don't, I really don't see the need. The it, the yeah. yeah, instead of regular business hours, why don't we just say during library business hours? I, I just don't see what's wrong with it as it's written. I mean, if, it's, if you're in the parking lot for business pertaining to the library, what does it matter if it's at 505 or 905. I think it works the way Councilor Bassett broke it into two lines. 
think so too. It, it may be sort of wordy, but I think it makes it more clear. Okay. I'm going to vote for yeah. either way. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> With the word potentially out. Whatever you want. I just, okay. I just potentially. don't see the okay. need. But. Okay. Can we move the question? All in favor of the traffic amendment, the new traffic ordinance as amended? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Okay. The next item on the agenda, item 96, is the receipt of a report from the Conservation Commission on access to Great Pond. That report is in your package. And um, I guess I would suggest that we set this for workshop. Yes, Madam Chairman. John Herrick, the Chairman of the Conservation Commission, is here. If you have any questions on this in a later item, but. You know, I would suggest that you refer this to your workshop on February 12th, uh, this coming Thursday evening, for you to begin to review it, and then, uh, you know, eventually bring it back to the council. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? Councillor Fritz. And I'd just like to comment that our Conservation Commission has really put out a lot of work, and uh, I think it's been very well done. Um, I t attended the um, neighborhood forum that you had um, to, to kind of work this through um, and I, I think it reflected what the people in the neighborhood felt and um, a very good job. Okay. Councilor Roberts. I would echo Carol's sentiments that it was well attended and, and well carried out and I had one question though and perhaps either John or Michael could answer it. On the Palanza deed, is there a is there a time period that that has to be accepted, or is it, are we open-ended on that? I, I would just encourage the council, if you plan to accept it, to, to do it before we lose the copy of it or okay. get away from us. All right, good, thanks. <coughs> okay. All in favor of, uh, I guess we're just setting this up for a workshop. Receiving the report. Receiving the report. And setting it for workshop. And I'm referring it to a workshop for this Thursday night at 7.30 for anyone in the public who is interested, although it might not be first on the agenda. Okay. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, zero. Okay, um, the next item, item 97, is the receipt of a report from the planning board recommending a tower overlay district be located in the area of Route 77 near Sprague Hall. And the recommendation is that this be set for a public hearing on March 8th. Would you like to say Just very briefly, Ed Char is here who's with LLC, is that the name of it? LCC consultants mm -hmm. who uh, uh, has been hired to work for a company called U.S. Cellular. Uh, Shaw Sprague is also here, who's a sort of representative of Sprague Corporation. Uh, if the council would like, you know, Mr. Shaw could give a brief overview this evening from the perspective of uh, the company that he's representing on uh, what this tower would accomplish and uh, other issues. Uh, although, you know, what's before the council is not specifically the proposal from his company, but it, but it is clear that you know if this was this uh, tower overlay was approved, the planning board could very likely be dealing with an application from his company. So if you're interested in doing that and hearing more, he is here. It looks like there's interest, and I'm sure the public would also be interested. So. Yeah. <clears throat> he obviously came prepared. <laughs> Just to remind me to raise my level of voice, I apologize. I have a couple of maps I'd like to put up first, and then I'll get into the discussion if I may. While Mr. Shaw is doing that, if I might, just to clarify for members of the public, uh, 
the planning board had two items to refer to it in terms of uh, a tower overlay district. And primarily what, what was referred by the council was to look at both as something in the area of Spray Corporation land as well as Fort Williams. Uh, the Fort Williams issue is still before the planning board. They have not reached a resolution of it. Uh, Mr. Shaw is only authorized by U.S. Cellular to represent the interest at this point uh, in their desire on the, the spray, what we refer to as the spray overlay zone. Uh, he's not authorized uh, by U.S. Cellular to uh, apply for or to request anything involving the Fort Wayne zone, but the planning board is continuing to look at that. Oh, um, Councillor Backer. Um, I have a question, if I may, about what we've been given as part of our packet tonight. And I note that the color uh, map that we were given this evening uh, differs from what was in our packet in defining the overlay district. It's, it's a hundred foot difference, yeah. Is, is the uh, one we were given this evening in color, is that the correct That's boundary? My understanding. Uh, I too was confused by it, if I can project, just because it seemed as though the one we had attached to our original packet covered both sides of the road on Bowery Beach and covered both sides of Charles Jordan Road. And what we have now looks to me where I think is the church parking lot. Maybe I'm reading. No, there's, there's no church there, so I'm not. Sure. The, uh, I'm sorry. That it's the next <coughs> intersection up, but it, so it's completely on one side of Bowery Beach Road now? Yes, it is. This, and this is the proposal from the planning board. Okay, so it's the corner, almost, the corner of Fowler and Bowery Beach. Right, it would be diagonally across Route 77, straight across from, from Sprague Hall. Okay, yeah. okay. So this, this one is just totally wrong. That one is not the one they ended okay. up proposing. the one they held the public hearing on, but it's, it's not the one they proposed. Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my, name is, my name is Ed Shaw, and I work for a company called LCC International. Um, we are a company that was hired by United States Cellular to deploy um, a network here in the Portland area for United States Cellular. And I'm just going to take about 15 minutes and give you the information similar to what I did for the planning board and then I'd be happy to answer questions or if along the way if you'd like to ask them I'd answer them then as well. Um, but basically United, I'm going to start with United States Cellular. They currently, uh, United States Cellular's customers when they're in Cumberland County, for example, when they used their phone, United States Cellular did not have a license to provide service in Cumberland County. So they had an agreement with Verizon Wireless so that when one of their customers came into Cumberland County, they would use Verizon Wireless um, power locations and equipment to use their cell phone here in Portland. United States Cellular has from Augusta and Lewiston north in the state of Maine, and they have over in New Hampshire. But they did not have York and Cumberland County, and a lot of their customers traveled between the two. So last year, about this time, they purchased a license. Um, there are nine licenses available in every city, everywhere in the United States right now. And uh, we purchased one, also United, excuse me, United States Cellular purchased a license and hired us to deploy a network so that this summer um, they could begin offering local service here in Cumberland, York County, as well as their customers that are up in the north and over in New Hampshire when they travel through Cumberland and York County, they'll be using United States Cellular's um, equipment instead of paying Verizon to use Verizon wireless equipment. So one of the first objectives that we had, LCC International, was to go through, and I'm just going to stick with Cumberland County and then specifically with Cape Elizabeth for tonight's meeting, but we went through Cumberland County and specifically Cape Elizabeth and looked at each one of the towns to find out what was currently available to us for locations where we could place our antennas and put equipment at the base of these towers that actually uh, allow the antennas to work. So this, how about those 
high tech new appointment skin <laughs> on one less coat hanger at my house. Um, what this map does here is I've shown uh, this map does not include the tower overlay district that we're talking about tonight. I'm just showing you where we've gone and where we've located existing ones, and then I'm going to show you a map that will show how adding this additional tower would improve the coverage. So in this particular instance, uh, we did find out in Cape Elizabeth that you have tower overlay districts. Two of them are in Cape Elizabeth, and currently there are two towers used by cellular carriers off the Sprout Lane off Sperling Avenue. And we approached uh, Mr. Sprout about placing our antennas on that tower. We were able to sign a lease with him. I went to the planning board and got approval to put our antennas on that tower, and they have been put there, and our equipment is at the base to run um, that site. So this particular triangle, uh, this symbol right here shows where our antennas are in Cape Elizabeth off Sperling Grove now. We then also looked in South Portland and Scarborough and tried to find other locations. There's a tower in South Portland over on Hillside Street. It currently has um, five cellular carriers, if you will, PCS or cellular carriers on it. We approached them. There was room for one additional one, and we put our antennas on that one as well. Over on Cash Corner was another existing monopole. Uh, we went there, we spoke with them, uh, we have signed a lease with them and are in the process of getting zoning to put our antennas on the cash corner location. And then lastly on Route 1 here, um, over by where the old Kmart used to be, it's now uh, Main Medical Center has some places there across the street or a few towers in Scarborough and we're going on one of them as well. So I had our RF engineer um, look at those locations, put them into a tool that he has which simulates how the coverage would be if we placed an antenna at a certain elevation and a certain location. We've plugged in the numbers for all four of those locations, and this is the coverage that you can see. The green here represents in-vehicle coverage, and um, these roads here, maybe just uh, so that with this particular map, this line here is Cape Elizabeth coming down through. This is Route 77 as it goes down past Fowler Road in the area that we're talking about an overlay district, as well as it comes down to where you can go down to two lights here, and then back up along in the shore road that goes along here by where uh, Fort Williams is. So after reviewing what we would get for coverage in these particular locations, we determined that we really need another location in Cape Elizabeth in order to provide better cellular service, or what we feel is adequate cellular service in Cape Elizabeth. You can see the southern area here um, uh, does not have the kind of coverage um, that we would prefer to have. And we took a look at the zoning ordinance and found out that there were two overlay zones and that the potential was there for potentially um, creating a new overlay zone. So I called up uh, the town manager and asked if potentially I could meet with him and the planner and the fire safety and police safety folks to find out where they had coverage now and where they didn't have it and see if we could work together to find a location where we could add an additional tower and improve both emergency services as well as cellular service. They really identified two locations that were problematic, if you will, for the emergency services. One of them was in Two Light State Park. Fort, at, Fort Williams. I keep doing that, I apologize. In Fort Williams up here, and they have a lot of major events there and that is a problem for them as well as down along 77 and anywhere along the coast down this way, there really is not adequate coverage. So United States Cellular's budget, unfortunately, would only allow um, placing antennas in two locations in Cape Elizabeth, and since we'd already chosen one, we only had uh, another location that we could choose. So after meeting with them, we took a look at Fort Williams, make sure I get that right, and then something that would be in the southern area here. After talking with them, um, it, I, I did uh, become aware that Spray Corporation owns most of the land. I guess they own all of the land on this side of 77 down to Crescent Beach. And then a great portion around, I guess this is Great Pond, does that sound right? Yeah. Um, so they really own the majority of the land in the area that we were proposing. This, the, ele the elevation near this intersection is about 60 feet above sea level. And that seemed to be the highest point in that area generally, and we thought if we could put one out near 77, we could do a better job of covering 77 and get down toward the coast without actually putting a tower on the coast. 
So we took a look at that area and that's what we talked to the planning board about and this was really the area somewhere at this intersection but we had not um, gotten to a place where we had come to um, a verbal agreement and are very close to a written agreement with Spray Corporation on where we could place that tower on their property in that area. So since meeting with the planning board, I've had several meetings with Spray Corporation or the representative for Spray Corporation, his name is Seth Spray. And after um, some of those negotiations, it was determined that this area on the south side of 77 is referred to as their core property. And the way that the corporation is written, you cannot enter into a lease in the core area for more than one year. I don't know if I have all of that exactly right, um, but it's pro basically we couldn't enter into a long-term lease over there. And Spray Corporation had decided that they would like for any commercial activities that might need to happen on their property to be on the other side of 77, which they consider their non-core um, area. So the first thing that we looked at is there is a ridge that goes along down toward the Great Pond, and that was away from this particular road, Fowler Road here, does have some houses along it on the north side. It has a, a row of trees, probably 50 to 75 uh, feet deep, all along the other side of this road, but we thought the best might be to find a location up here where there weren't many houses now, which was ruled out because of the uh, stipulation from Spray Corporation. So when we looked over here, along this ridge seemed to be the best location. However, it also happened to be the main entrance for Spray uh, Corporation to getting into the Great Pond area. So that being the main road that goes down in there, they didn't want to put the tower right on the entrance into their area when they come to redevelop it. So they asked us to look at two locations in particular. One would be up further toward the actual intersection and another one down here by Crescent Beach. We looked at the one across the street from Crescent Beach in the woods there and unfortunately the elevation was only about 10 feet above sea level. And by putting uh, the specifics in there, it did not provide the coverage that we were looking for in Cape Elizabeth. So we did run one for the intersection up by Fowler Road and we found that that one did a very good job of covering both 77 and many places along here. This map has all of the sites that are on this map up here, as well as, hmm, let's just keep it up in the air a little ways here. I'll put it off. hopefully you can see here is that the coverage from this particular site by adding another overlay and putting the 180 foot tower um, in the area that we're proposing for an overlay zone this is a representation of the tower and the coverage both down in the Sprague's property as well as along you can see here there's no coverage down in Sprague's property for the most part in here, some high elevations you might be able to make a call, but it does a great job of covering it there, as well as 77 going off into Scarborough. Um, in this particular map, that would be off going down this way toward Higgins Beach, and 77 coming around and coming over this way. You can see that that would be covered now, and would and would be uh, the, the service would be excellent along that road. So what I was trying to accomplish with these two particular um, graphs was if we can only go on the one Cape Elizabeth Tower location, this is what the coverage will look like, and quite frankly, that's what the coverage looks like for all the cellular areas in Cape Elizabeth now, because all of the cellular areas are located at this location and nowhere else in Cape Elizabeth. Mr. Shaw, um, I, I can't tell exactly from that map particular neighborhoods. Uh, maybe if I was closer, I could, but can you tell me uh, whether the spot that remains white, is that Broad Cove? Maybe one of the counselors who's closer can tell whether that's Broad Cove, because that's where I've heard the most complaints, and I'm wondering if we're missing with the tower the one area that I hear the most complaints from. 
because it's so heavily populated. And yeah, I know from the map that the largest green area that you're coming down on, there's probably no more than 10 houses in that entire place. It does cover Route 77 pretty well, but it looks like Shore Acres and, and Broad Cove, um, the areas that we get most of the points we don't have service are not being covered. So they're putting a tower there. We're still going to need another one down on the other end. And if something were, I'm not sure if we want to go with a tower there, then still have to address the tower that needs down on the other end of the town as well. Or if another one on the other town would cover 77, something coming backwards. So that, that is Broad Cove, all that white. And I would, I'd be, I guess that's Broad Cove. Uncovered. The top Cell white, phone area. white section. Yeah, unfortunately, it looks like Broad Cove. Yeah. Is it. I know we're going to put this to public hearing, but it seems to me that if we're going to add a tower to fix the problem, it ought to be where the people, the people live and not where there's not a lot of population. So. Yeah. I guess maybe a suggestion would be for the public hearing next month, it would be very useful to identify yeah. by neighborhood Absolutely. where the white areas are. According to this, what still would not be covered would be the Pilot Point Road section of Shore Acres, uh, possibly Algonquin Road in Shore Acres, as well as the, the land in Broad Cove uh, immediately adjacent to the water, uh, South Fair Lane. Mm -hmm. uh, Salisbury Lane uh, would be here, and then it, it goes up to partway up, you know, that lower section of Broad Cove when you make that turn. Yeah. You might be picking that up. I'm I'm wondering whether you have the have done the elevations. Of, I mean, when I went down there to look at the area, it looked as though what was on the east side of Route 77 was higher. So that if you got the tower up higher, in as in, you know, some of the area of the original proposal that was in our packet, I realized that on this side of 77 is that the same thing? Is that what you the mean? yeah the outside of 77 okay. rather than the inside as in what you gave us tonight? Yep. That seemed higher. Yep. Yeah. But and so it would I would assume be up higher and, and then could get down to Broad Cove and Shore Acres better. Councillor Swift had, but didn't um, Mr. Shaw say that the Sprague have some uh, restrictions on their land so it can't, it can't be there anyway? Mm. I mean, I, I don't know whether they can get around that. It seems to me we ought to be after the service and having the least number of towers. Um, that are necessary. I agree with those at, at goal. That was my understanding from what Mr. Shaw said that that wasn't a possibility. Well, I, I don't know if it's an absolute not no possibility. A couple of uh, couple of ways I'd like to address some of the things that you just brought up. One of them is um, I did meet with uh, Steph, like I said several times, and Spray Corporation is not willing to open up that area anymore. Can they legally at this time uh, enter into the any any contracts of any, of any sort with us. So I, I really don't have an option as a um, trailer carrier to lease some land uh, to be able to take that power down and do something there. It's just not possible for that to happen. So one of the other things that I did not mention earlier was we did notice in the uh, zoning in Cape Elizabeth you have an extensive or very well laid out um, policy for um, or an ordinance for stealth be able to put your antennas inside of a church steeple or inside of some structure so that it's not visible to somebody walking their dog or driving by. So we looked at a lot of different locations and one of them was Shore Acres, uh, which is over in that area that I think you're referring to. Uh, there's a water tower up there owned by the Portland Water District and that was one of the ones that we tried to take a look at. Well, it was made abundantly clear um, to me at the meeting that I had with the town officials that the folks in that area, the idea of putting a tower up or putting sideline antennas in that area would not go over well and would be 
um, would be a very long battle and would only provide if we were to go on a water transfer one from the carriers to have service up there, but not the other eight license um, carriers that are allowed by the Telecommunications Act to provide service in here. So that area being um, heavily populated and being mostly houses and such, if you will, if you look at the revenue statistics of cellular um, towers and roads that they cover, we always look for traffic counts because that's where a majority of the cellular calls are made are on roads. And so one of the things that we were looking at was we only have one tower in Cape Elizabeth, we want to try to cover the most heavily traveled roads. And this one happened to be 77 along here, as well as find a place in the town where we might be able to convince somebody to be able to place the tower. Um, we, we did look at shore acres, and if we put a tower up there, it would cover that area. But we did not feel like from um, demographics and geography, if we were to try to um, offer to place the tower over in that area, it just didn't seem like the most logical. We thought we'd try to find an area where there weren't a lot of houses and a, the least amount of visual impact that we could from the people who were already living in the house. So those are some of the things that we took into consideration, even though I agree there are not, maybe there are only 20 houses, if you will, out in this area currently today. Um, I'm not sure that it will be that way down the road. And 77 and out along the roads that were highly traveled is where we were looking for the coverage. Um, I, two towers will not completely cover Cape Elizabeth. You can see that, for example, the Fort Williams area is not addressed by this tower at all. But what we were looking for was if there has to be another tower in Cape Elizabeth, how can we cover the most area with that other tower and be the least obtrusive to the people who live in that community? And, and, and that's really the driving force that brought us to where we are now, is placing it down here. It does as good a job as you can from being inland, going out toward the coast, because all of these areas that are white down here slopes down toward the water. And the only way to cover an area that slopes down toward the water is to actually physically put the antennas over in that area and shoot them down. And um, perhaps stealth would work for covering some of those areas in an existing lighthouse or something like that to be able to take care of some of them, but they certainly won't handle nine carriers. And the possibility of putting a tower out along the coast here is, uh, in my opinion, plain to none. Professor Roberts. Yeah, with that scenario, putting those two there, you still need two more than to get the coverage that the town needs. One at Fort Williams and still one down below in some fashion. If you had this one here that you're proposing down that way and one of them by Fort Williams, would the three then adequately, adequately cover Cape Elizabeth? Yes, they would. Thank you. Let me, if I might. Go ahead. Did you just say that if there was one at Fort Williams <coughs> that it would shoot back toward that coastal area? Be, being in the Fort Williams area, and I provided for the workshop, for the planning board workshop earlier this month, our chief went there. I provided a map that showed what the coverage would look like on a 40-foot tower if it were placed beside the fire station there in Fort Williams, and then if it were an 80-foot tower, and then if it were a 120-foot one. And the 120-foot tower, I don't think probably ever happened in Cape Elizabeth, but what it did was it was high enough to shoot down along the coast, and many of the places along the coast did have service if there were 120 foot tower there. Whether or not you're going to convince someone to put a 120 foot tower in Fort Williams is another question altogether. But what we were trying to do was if we had to have two towers in Cape Elizabeth, basically, and, and, and you folks did back in 1989 create two tower overlay districts. One of them is where the towers are now, and another one is at the transfer station, which unfortunately is only about 1.25 miles as pro flies from the existing location. So the economics, it's been that way for 11, 12 years now, and nobody has approached the town to place another tower there because it's just too close to the other one. So what we normally try to do with a town, if they only have one tower or if they don't have towers at all, is try, to, especially with the um, terrain and topography as it is in Cape Elizabeth is to try to have three of them in three different locations and come in from different angles to make up for the ones that are hidden by the hills from the other tower. Councilor Fritz. 
what are the limitations you're talking about? Um, for I mean, there's nine different carriers now. What are, what are the limitations on like size of a structure? How many could you put in, say, the Berwyn Church or in there's the old World War II tower at, at Two Light or the lighthouse? Again, another great question. Um, the way it is, I'm not an RF engineer, but I have been uh, a network engineer for telecommunications for 13 years. We have a requirement in each one of these locations where we've already uh, placed antennas is there has to be 10 feet of vertical separation between the antennas for one carrier and the antennas for the other. If you go horizontally, it's about 50 feet. But in most applications, it's on a, some sort of tall structure. And if you, I, I do have some pictures that I could place up here of an existing tower. This one I'll put up here. There's an existing tower just off 295 at the Wobotukis Bridge if you were heading toward Falmouth. And this particular tower And this picture has four carriers on it. There's actually five on there now. Well, we're on there. And we're 10 feet between uh, the center of that antenna down to the next one. So you can see the group of antennas at the top here are at 180 feet. The next one's down, which is T-Mobile, is at 170. And then AT&T Wireless is down at 160. Verizon Wireless is at 150. And then we're going down uh, at 135 is where we chose, and that was basically because of the structure analysis on the tower and what it could hold. I don't think they originally thought as many people were going to go on that when they put it up. But the uh, adage of, if you build a tower, they will come, is true, unfortunately. But I, I, I think it's fortunate, because if you've got to build the towers and you're going to have nine carriers eventually, let's get them together, put them in specific locations, put everybody on them, and be done with it. Yeah. And the one that we're proposing to put down here um, at the intersection um, is, will take care of anything along the southern side of Cape Elizabeth. It'll be done as a real wood, and you'll still have two problem areas in Cape Elizabeth. And I don't know that they'd be resolved all of them problems at Fort Williams. But an area which is problematic over here is in the Fort Williams area. And then, of course, this other one down along the coast, we're going to have to try to find another way down the road to address that one. Michael. Yeah, I know the Chief of Police, uh, Neil Williams, spoke at the Planning Board meeting. I, I heard he did a good job, but I didn't watch it. I don't know what he said. Uh, this particular tower overlay propo proposal that, you're, that the Planning Board is making, that you, you folks are making, does it do anything for public safety? Did, did the chief believe, believe that it does anything for public safety? Yes, it does. And when I, when I left that meeting, um, uh, he said you're still going ahead with the Sprague location as well, because he was talking about the Fort Williams one at that location. He said, he said I'm planning on that, and I'm really looking forward to being there. Now, I'll, I'll step back for a second and just give you one other piece of information regarding frequencies is um, right now um, the police department and the fire department use um, some frequencies that are around 155 megahertz. It's going to take a minute just to talk about this. But the FCC has the entire spectrum of frequencies available to them, and they are the police of those, that spectrum, and they determine who gets what frequency. Emergency fire and uh, safety folks are at the 155 megahertz um, bandwidth, and that particular bandwidth has the physical characteristics of going, penetrating through buildings, penetrating through leaves, and going a lot farther than the frequencies as you go up in the spectrum. So there at 155, their coverage would look dramatically better than this, because they're at 155 megahertz down here. The two cellular carriers that came out and that are currently Verizon Wireless and AT&T Wireless, they are at 800 megahertz, which is quite a ways up on the uh, frequency band, and the characteristics, physical characteristics of 800 megahertz work pretty good, um, and these show the coverage um, at that 800. 
Um, the other carriers, when the FCC determined two, two competitors in every market wasn't enough competition, so they opened seven more for everybody. They didn't have any frequencies left near 800, so they had to go up to 1900 megahertz. And that's where the other um, seven carriers got their frequencies, is up at 1900. 1900 megahertz doesn't do as good a job physically penetrating, getting through the leaves, going into the building, going around the hills and up over doing some deflection. So the frequencies that we have here are in the 800 to 1900 megahertz, but the police ones at 155 will penetrate further and will look better. But if, if I might, for purposes of full disclosure, FCC regulations currently provide that eight or nine years from now, all public safety they desire to have in the 800 megahertz range. That's correct. We still don't know if that's going to stick, but that is that's current FCC regulation. And the plan in my talking with the chief was probably if we if this was approved and we put a tower here, because of the amount of penetration you can get with 155, you don't want to be at 100 and feet up on the tower because it would cover down into Saco and off into Portland so they'll probably end up at around 100 feet on this tower and it'll give them better coverage than you see here and then when they do go to 800 megahertz um, the proposal is to set a slot if you will or an elevation on the tower reserve it for the public safety and they will be the ones who will be able to use it when they do go to that frequency. Mr. Shaw, if I can, I may. Um, so that map on the left, the green on that is showing the 800 megahertz coverage? 800 megahertz. Okay. Thank you. Um, so someone who's on Verizon or AT&T, they're higher than that. So the coverage is not as good as that map is showing, perhaps. Um, this particular map is showing our elevations. If I were to change it up, if it were 20 feet higher than me, it would change it a little bit. If it were 20 feet lower, it would change it a little bit. It'd have to be on a per carrier basis. But usually if you get up over the trees, and the tree line generally is about 80 feet. Once you get up over there, up into the 120, 130, from there, the incremental differences of 10 feet doesn't change much. You just have to get up above the trees so that you can See, it's mostly line of sight. It's what the RF engineer tells me is whether you can see the tower, you can use it. That, that's a general 1900 um, megahertz uh, answer. And so, what he's trying to do is get up to an elevation here so that the coverage uh, is the best it can be for the sub. Councillor Fritz. If I recall from when we did the study a number of years ago, we were told, and maybe this is what you're talking about, I'm not sure, but that new technology that will be coming out will require shorter distances for the towers and not as high and not as far apart and that sort of thing. So that I'm wondering whether these towers will become really obsolete very shortly and what happens to the tower then? Um, and maybe I'm not understanding it uh, adequately. <laughs> Things are changing so quickly, I'm not sure exactly what will happen down the road, but I do know that I got clear direction from the United States that I like to enter into a minimum of 20 year leases, if not 25. Um, and some of the discussion back years ago when we, when we created them was there were going to be two cellular carriers at 800 and then the other frequencies that were going to be given were going to be way up on the spectrum. The physical characteristics weren't going to be that they went very far, but they would be able to design equipment that would be relatively inexpensive compared to what you pay for the equipment that's at the base of the towers now. So that perhaps you could put them on telephone poles or in all these places and do that. The, the dollars and the um, it hasn't it hasn't come around. Nobody's offering that equipment. At a, it, it costs us now about three hundred thousand dollars to put the equipment in so it goes at the base of that. So you still have to get that number way down before you start putting in multiple locations to cover um, what I think you're referring to. Repeaters for the ten they mm -hmm. use. Yep. Yep. Repeaters. Yep. And we do use repeaters. There are locations where we're trying to just cover one particular area. 
We just need to get the antennas so that they're visible in that area and they will work there. Um, and my guess would be that the other locations in Cape Elizabeth that do not have coverage that will eventually require it and get it for competitive would be done by the team. I don't see another tower being built over in Cape Elizabeth along the coast. The uh, maps that you have up there right now are showing the U.S. cellular coverage, correct? Two questions. There are other carriers in the area, for example, Verizon. Um, would their map look different than yours or exactly the same? Not exactly the same. Um, but substantially the same? Uh, yes, substantially. Okay, so they're not covering that end of 77 now either. No. And my second question is if you put a tower in, um, they can't get a signal off your device without putting their own device in, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So, I'm okay. Um, I, I just want to make sure I understand the facts. Um, <coughs> your company is at this point proposing just one, if I heard you right. And that's all in the near term or long term, foreseeable future. Okay. I realize we're not taking any action tonight, but I just I just want to let you know I have some difficulty if you are only making an investment in one, making an investment in a place where I understand you, you're covering 77, but we're missing the areas where I've heard and experienced the most difficulty, the Shore Acres Broad Cove. So um, I guess I'll, I'm going to need more convincing or more information if we're looking to have some action next month on that, if indeed your company is only making one investment, because I have a question in my mind whether that's the best investment from the town standpoint. It may well be the best investment from your company's standpoint. I'm not trying to suggest to you how to do business, but from the town standpoint, I'm going to want to be convinced from the residents of the town that that's the best location. So uh, I guess, you know, we'll have, um, I assume we're going to set this up for public hearing and we'll have other opportunities to pursue <coughs> that. Councillor Swift, rather. Yes, assuming that there would only be one other tower, um, I would be interested since we're also perhaps thinking about Port Williams. As a, as a location, I'd be interested in seeing similar, a similar map as to the left-hand one, which would be the, the coverage if there were a tower up there, as opposed to the um, tower down by the spray truck, just to see where the green would be then. Michael? Yeah, I, you know, Herb Strauss has been donating some of his services to the owner of the current tower testing radios at different locations and uh, he's been very helpful in that regard and I'm hoping that he comes forward with that data between now and the next month. The other piece that we need to look at and I'm not sure the answer is you know, what's interesting is South Portland has a repeater I think up on Munjoy Hill and Neil was, has been at Fort Wood, hmm? no South Portland has a repeater up on Munjoy Hill. Munjoy Hill? On Munjoy Hill because it comes back to the mm -hmm. South Portland coast. Interestingly, Chief Googins, the, the chief of police in uh, South Portland, was at Portland Headlight with Chief Williams. And they said, you know, let, let's test out our phones or whatever and radios. And the South Portland uh, radio frequencies work just fine <laughs> uh, down at Portland Headlight, which, which, you know, implies for helping with Port Williams is, you know, another option for us is to look at wherever South Portland is. Uh, on Munjoy Hill in, in Portland because, you know, the radio waves do not know municipal boundaries. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one other piece, and, you know, I, I know we like to be parochial, uh, but, you know, I think it's, it's also important as we look at this issue from the, the full issue of public safety to not look at municipal boundaries. And uh, I know Scarborough recently rejected, because of some community opposition, some proposals, but I, I do think it's important as one considers this issue to look at the impacts on Scarborough, both from a public safety 
uh, communication point of view, as well as from uh, some citizens, at least one citizen has called from a visual impact point of view that they have concerns as well. So uh, I just wanted to, to bring that in that, that these things do not know municipal boundaries. Madam Chair. I understand that. I'm just trying to make sure Point we six. have the most covered for the number of towers that we have. Councilor Swift. I'm, I'm concerned with coverage in the Broad Cove area too because I've heard from folks down there. But I am also very concerned with coverage in the Fort Williams area considering the, from a public safety point of view, considering how many events we have there and just regular visitors, you know, not for any special event, but and I have also heard from people who live in that area that they're concerned because just people with this residence. And then that's a very heavily populated area also. Right. They don't have coverage. So um, I know we have no recommendation yet from the planning board with regard to what to do about a potential overlay district up at Fort Williams. Fort Williams. But I want to make sure that we, that the discussion covers dead spots everywhere in town. And it, it may make sense, as I sit and listen to this, that that we have a discussion that looks at both at the same time yeah. instead of in a way where a company that, that comes in and says we are only in a position to make a single investment, mm -hmm. um, that we don't do this sort of seriatim because it may not be what's best for the town. Michael? Well, I was just going to say the work we have before us tonight is possibly to set this to a public hearing, but are we really ready, I don't, as this is an open question to the other councils, are we really ready to set this to a public hearing when we're about to hear from the planning board again on what they may or may not do for Fort Williams Park? We obviously, looks like we need a repeater across the water there facing back at Fort Williams for public safety, which would also hit down the coast. But before we ask the public to come in every other month to give us their response for these different cell tower requests, maybe we need to take an extra month to try and gather them all up together at once. It's just a thought. I think it's a terrific thought, and I, I feel badly because uh, after we put the original antennas on the tower and throw them in, the next thing we looked at is if we've got to build a tower in Cape Woods, that where would be the best place to build it? And, and we have, um, because of this project, we're building 71 sites in the, in the course of 11 months. And so what we wanted to do was take a look at where would the other, if we're going to have to change the overlay district, where would the other zone be that we might be able to get um, coverage at and could we get them off? Or, if you will, United States Cellular, when they begin to provide service this summer, they're going to be the seventh one to provide service in the greater Portland area. And a lot of people already have phones or already have their own. So we wanted to try to be just a little bit better than them, if you will. And we had an opportunity with some money to try to choose another location in Cape Elizabeth. And uh, for that period of time of 10 months and 71 sites, which most companies won't do, they two or three or four sites a year in a particular market especially up here in Maine. And um, what we did was we have an in-house RF engineer who has a program and can put virtually anywhere for a location and find out what the coverage is. And, and, and we've, we've gone to several locations in Cape Elizabeth trying to find where's the best one. And initially when I heard about Sprague Corporation down here, uh, I don't know who they are. They're a large corporation. It'll take a long time. Let's find some other place that we can go and do this. We could not find a location that gave us more coverage for the amount of, for a one tower location than this one. But unfortunately, I didn't bring all those maps here tonight to show you because uh, I guess maybe just shame on me. Um, but after meeting with the planning board and going over with some of them, I, I felt like we were in an area where we had a second location that would take care of itself. And then that third and fourth location would definitely need to be worked out. Um, at the next meeting, if there were a next meeting, I would certainly bring whatever maps you wanted to see of any locations in Cape Elizabeth and show you what they do for coverage and how they react. But of all the ones that we looked at, this one took care of everything in the south and the major road 77. And then those other areas like Fort William where there is spotty coverage and this area here, 
different companies are going to have to make that decision on whether or not that's more important to them for a competitive ed edge or not. But we're trying to get a couple of towers in every town so that we could provide similar coverage to everybody else. And we felt like in Cape Elizabeth, just being on this only this location, it was worth spending the money to be in another location and to provide the most amount of coverage from that location. And I'm talking too much. Thanks. So I may be getting ahead of of things a little bit because I know the planning board is still uh, looking at Port Williams, but I guess I would ask you specifically, is the uh, Sprague location, I, what you're saying is that is a better location than Port Williams? Absolutely. The, okay. Cause I thought I heard you earlier say, well, we sort of put Fort Williams on hold because we weren't sure we could ever really do anything there, maybe for other reasons, political reasons. Um, no, I apologize if I came across that way. That's not what I meant to communicate. Uh, if we put a tower in Fort Williams, or if we chose for that for a direction, that's the area we would have covered. covered. And then we felt like we still got a huge area of Cape Elizabeth that's not being covered. So one of the things that we do when we go in there is try to put up two, if you will, I'll borrow that term, four, four towers that take care of the majority of the town. And then you've got to find places to take care of small specific mm -hmm. areas. And with the deployment and the time frame and the things that we were looking, looking at, where can we put two solid locations in Cape Elizabeth that give us the most amount of coverage we can get? And then for fill-ins after that, it'll be a, a, probably a marketing decision on where those other dollars for repeaters go after that. We got to move on. Can I ask one more question? I hate to bring this up. The water, the politically unpopular water tower site. If there was a monopole put at that location, uh, is that preferable to the spray site? No. no. And um, I'm going to have to ask you this. I wish I'd brought the Arab engineer with me tonight. That's the first thing. And he has more maps than you can imagine. And he, I could bring in several locations, any places uh, in Cape Elizabeth where the elevation is above 50 feet, and show you what a tower and would do for coverage in those locations. You might, come to the same conclusion. you might plan to do that. At, yeah. uh, we will, in a few minutes, be setting this, I think, for public hearing at some point. And um, you might plan to do that and bring whoever else. Um, would be helpful. Um, but this, I thank you because I know this has been a very helpful explanation and it's given us a lot to think about um, going forward and it, it has been extremely helpful. Well, thank you for saying that. I just feel like uh, one other thing that I'd like to say is unfortunately I'm summarizing approximately two and a half months of working with the planning mm -hmm. board and the planner and the chief of police and everything for where was the best location and I brought the best location to you folks tonight. Unfortunately, I didn't bring the backup to show you how I arrived there, and I'm, I guess I misunderstood and misjudged, and I apologize. No, no, no need to apologize. Again, uh, I think we asked a lot of questions tonight. It's a topic that people are discussing, Absolutely. and we wanted to get some education on it, but we fully anticipate that there will be more discussion of it down the road, so okay. no need to apologize. You've been very well prepared, I'm sure, as far as... Very uh, helpful as far as everyone is concerned, so hmm. thank you. Just very briefly, I, I would like to thank the Sprague Corporation as well for their willingness to look at this issue. They, you know, were not doing this out of a, a profit uh, motive. Mm -hmm. They were doing it out of the motive of, of providing a service to Cape Elizabeth and uh, addressing public safety, and I appreciate their attention to this and uh, their work. Uh, with the planning board as well as uh, with this uh, private entity. Okay, so um, we need to discuss when to have a public hearing. Councilor Swift, could I ask a question of the manager, please? Um, when, what is the time frame for the planning board looking at the Fort Williams property? Because I am interested in sort of considering this issue in, in Toto rather than this one location and then suddenly looking at another location. My, if, if anyone in the room knows differently, my recollection is that they they didn't have a specific timetable. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, okay. 
Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, thanks the fourth <laughs> estate here. <laughs> yeah, they, they've kicked it around. They're, they're going to talk about it some more, but I don't think they have a specific deadline. You know, although I said I didn't want to do it seriatim, I'm also sensitive to the private sector's need that they make investments, they've come, they've asked us a question, and when I used to be on the other side of this podium, it would be a source of frustration to have the government officials put it off for a couple of months. I guess I'd like to suggest we hold the public hearing. It may well be that we decide then we need more time, but maybe there's an equal chance that we won't and we'll be able to reach a decision. So if they're you know, willing to bring all their charts and, and uh, work with it from that standpoint, I just assume, I think having thought about it, go forward next month with a public hearing and we can always put it off if we have to, but I'd like to. Yeah. I guess I would def rather defer and have a workshop first rather than getting neighbors coming down all cranked up about a tower going in the neighborhood before we even have a clue what we're doing ourselves. They can come to the public hearing though. I, I don't know if you've seen the planning board minutes. Uh, notices were sent to all of the abutters in this area as well as all around Fort William and no one spoke in opposition. So, you know, while there may be some opposition that comes up, uh, you know, up to this point in time, there's been uh, a lot, you know, some public, there's been some questions, but there's been no, no real opposition. If anything, the comments I've heard from people has been more along the lines of, I can't get cellular service and do something. So, uh, and not that I have made up my mind on anything, but Rather than delay it, I guess I'd like to have the public hearing, get more information, see the rest of Mr. Shaw's maps if necessary, and encourage the public to come. They have been to the planning board, or haven't been, I guess, but they certainly know about it. What do we have on our plate for this workshop coming up this week? We have a fair amount this week. We have the land trust uh, request for a donation to Jordan Farm, we have town on lot report and the tour map. Plus what we just scheduled, the uh, the Great Pond access. So that's a pretty full workshop, Councilor Mall. I assume that if we bring this to public hearing next month, then there's enough negative and positive discussion against it that we do not have to vote on it that night. I think it'll be entirely up to and, the council. And I would go along with letting the private sector have another opportunity to state their case. We're mm -hmm. not forced to give them an answer if we don't We're not forced seem, to. Uh, you know, I'd be for setting it next month, although I think it's, I don't like the idea of handling these things in a serial manner. However, that's not U.S. Cellular's well, they're not even involved with the other tower issues. Yeah. And, and Mr. Shaw made clear, at least I, I thought tonight, that they were asking for this, and it wasn't right. this as opposed to Fort Williams. So there isn't anyone else in line looking to do anything else at this point. Councilor Becker. Mr. Shaw, I'd just like to add one comment. And your, your, your maps are very illustrative thank you for bringing those um, the one comment that we seem to hear and I think this is reflective of what Councillor Lynch was saying also is that we're hearing from residents who don't aren't able to get cellular service at their home more so than having residents say I can't get service when I'm traveling the southern range of 77. And I heard you saying, on the other hand, that the Fowler Road site is the superior site from your perspective because it covers more roadway rather than population density. Um, and for residents of Cape Elizabeth, that doesn't seem to be a big concern, at least not what not that we're hearing. 
people seem to want to be able to get cellular service at their homes. Now, I happen to live in the area of Broad Cove that is shown on the map as white, <laughs> under any scenario. I really don't care, personally, because I don't use a cell phone <laughs> at home. Um, people always come to our house and they pull out their cell phone to use it, and I tell them to put it away. <laughs> but that's a small matter. Um, but what I do hear from people is, I can't get cell service at home. Isn't there something we can do about that? As opposed to saying, I don't get cell service when I'm traveling from Cape Elizabeth to Scarborough on 77. So I'm just wondering if maybe um, U.S. Cellular and you on their behalf could sort of rethink the strategy and whether, and again, I'm not tuned into the politics of the water tower um, in Shore Acres, although I know exactly where it is and can see how the elevation of that could be attractive as to whether or not, um, you know, your strategy of focusing on Fowler Road is the right one. Councillor Malden. By, by Councillor Backer, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, but just like Councillor Backer, I hear the exact same comments. I try to reach people that live along the coast, you can't get them by cell phone, they can't get you by cell phone. I live right on the edge where I can get cell coverage most of the time, but not all the time. When people are traveling down Route 77 in their car, the strip of road that they're traveling across where they lose cell coverage at your normal rate of speed, they lose cell coverage for a minute to two minutes. When you're in your home or any of those other white areas, you're losing it for the entire time you're in there you know, hours or overnight, as a supplier of service, trying to service all the customers is, you know, fairly densely populated in those areas. You probably have a better luck getting more customer impact in those areas than you do for that mile of Route 77. But again, I'm not trying to tell you how to run your business, but just echoing Councillor Backer's feelings and the feelings of the other councillors about our need for coverage along the coast. I guess as I'm, I'm listening, you know, I'm thinking that we, we really aren't ready for a public hearing next month. Um, if, if you rethink um, covering neighborhoods that are like Broad Cove, um, I'd like to hear more about the fact that South Portland public safety got signals at Fort Williams from the tower, you know, from other towers outside of Cape Elizabeth, and we might get coverage that way. I, I don't know. It just well, seems like we're not quite I think that, that well, the whole purpose of a public hearing is to get more information. And I guess we can take a vote on that because we still have a long agenda. Yes. That's okay. I want everyone to have their say, right. so, so don't worry. I'm here all night. My <laughs> time too. is your time. <laughs> and vice versa. Um, I would hope that at the public hearing, usually public hearings are set for a specific purpose, and I, I would want to make sure that people were invited, citizens were invited to speak on cell phone service within the town. If we just say it has to do with this particular overlay. We may be missing the input from people up in Cottage Farms and people who live near Fort Williams and wherever. That may give us a sense of their priorities for service and so on. I would in, I'm not sure how that works with the public hearing, but I would like to get a somewhat broader perspective on the interest of people um, on public safety and cell phone coverage. Well, I think whether we call that a public hearing or just a request for comment from people on, tel on cell phone service, we I certainly... Think it would be more helpful for us in making decisions about yeah. this tower overlay district to know whether citizens' priorities lay in a different mm -hmm. direction. Well, yeah. Father Councilor... I, I don't believe there's a, there's a motion on the agenda and if there was a motion, it could be inclusive to whatever degree the mm -hmm. council wishes it to be. Did you want to make a motion? I w then I would move that um, we 
set this general issue to um, public hearing for March 8, 2004, for citizens, for the purpose of citizens, Cape the citizens providing input on the issue of public safety, safety and cell phone coverage within Cape Elizabeth and not restrict it just to this particular tower overlay district that is being considered. But I, if you would accept a friendly amendment that it also including specifically this particular It would include one. this but not be restricted just to this. It would be broader. Is there a second? Councilor Moles has seconded. Any further discussion on the motion to set this for public hearing? I will, I will, I will support it. Uh, I'd like to add that I think public hearings, before we have all information, are probably going to shed more heat than light. So I will support it. And we hear what's being said. Okay. Or we may not get all that much input if, if we're not talking about specific things. I mean, I think if we're still kind of in the decision making and discussion, then I don't know that we get that much input. Well, that's why, Carol, I said I wanted specifically this issue, the specific location as well as in general. So I hope that we will get as much information as we need on this. Councilman McGinty. If we're going to discuss Fort William, um, Will the abiders be notified again? Well, I don't know that we need to since we are speaking in general and there is no specific proposal with respect to Fort Williams, but I wouldn't have it for the I, like I, it, I would think like it would be great, but that. I would think they would be, I think it would be great to do it. But I, I, I would think they would be very interested parties mm -hmm. since the only other thing the only other district were even peripherally at this point to, um, potentially considering as a Fort Can you, Michael, can you send out notices to abutters of Fort William? I can't, but the town will. Okay, well. <laughs> and I'm sure that the press will adequately provide notice to the public. I see them taking notes in the audience. Okay. Um, any further discussion of the motion? All in favor of setting this for public hearing for March 8th? One, two, three, four, five, six. Opposed? One. Madam Chair, yes. I point of order. Um, do we also have to receive this report? Yeah, we can receive it. Yes, okay. We have a motion to receive the report. I, Thank I you. would move that we receive the report from the Planning Board recommending a tower overlay district to be located in the area of Route 77 in the Spray Hall. And second. a second. All in favor? Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Thank you, mm -hmm. Ann. I'll get this job down just about the time I get to turn it over to some other lucky counselor. <laughs> I think that was partly Thanks, my fault from rambling on. For Mr. Time. Shaw, thank you very much. You. It's clearly been a lot of work and a lot of thought. And thank you. Yes. Do you need those maps or can you leave them? I will leave them. That'd be great. We'll we take them down. Or? No, just leave them there. We'll keep them there for next month or so. If okay. anyone wants to drop in, they can look at them. Thank you, Mr. Shaw. Thank, Thank you. That was really informative. Okay. The next item on our agenda is item 98, an action on proposal to amend the charter of the school building committee to permit the filling of vacancies. When we created the school building committee, which is a committee of uh, three councillors, three school board members, three members of the public um, to assist with the school building project. We provided that vacancies would not be filled, um, thinking that people would serve and if it got, uh, if we had a resignation, then um, they just would not be filled. But it's very early in our work and we ex we've had one uh, resignation and we expect another one shortly. Um, Ann Belden on the school board would like to resign and the school board would like to name Kathy Ray, one of the new school board members to this committee. So um, we would like to change the charter to permit um, that vacancies would be um, replaced on this committee. So, 
so moved. I can have a motion. Thank you. And a second. Any further discussion? Yeah, just to, to clarify to make sure everyone heard you correctly, Ann Belden wishes to resign from this committee, not from the school yes, board. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, before Did I say that? Oh, no, you okay. Didn't, but it, it was no, just, so just from the enough. school building committee because she's doing other committee work. Okay, all in favor? Right. <clears throat> so, you, uh, in this change, we are also anticipating another resignation shortly, in, in which case that would be someone that... We have had one member of yeah. the public resign mm -hmm. already, yeah. and we anticipate that Ann Belden on the school board will resign, okay? Okay, so oh. you and uh, Marie Prager would then be selecting one person, and Marie would be selecting another person. Exactly. The selections will be made by um, the same appointing authorities, that is Marie Prager, the chairman of the school board, and myself, as were made originally. Okay? Councilor Lynch, would it be appropriate perhaps to indicate why the citizens also has left the, the board? People don't think it's just natural defection. Sure, <laughs> sure. Now, uh, the uh, citizen who left um, has a lot of experience in the building trade and in fact was why he was asked to serve on it, but um, we've since come to, I guess, he has since come to believe that he should, because of all his connections in the building community, resign because of any potential for a conflict of interest. He is not sitting on the job, but he does work um, and sometimes have um, commercial transactions with some of the bidders, so he has um, very wisely um, step down before any such conflict could occur and we appreciate his service and we'll be moving on from there so that is the background on it and we have a motion and we have a second is there any other discussion all in favor one two three four five six seven okay item <coughs> 99 is action on a request from PAX to confirm that the PAX region within Cape Elizabeth shall be unchanged from that which has been in place since 1994. And Michael, I'm going to ask you to comment on that, if you will. The, the current metropolitan planning area for Cape Elizabeth for PAX is the entire uh, geographic uh, uh, area of Cape Elizabeth. We should probably state what PAX is for the public. Thank you. PAX is the Regional Transportation Planning Agency. It divvies up the highway improvement funds, the bikeway funds, the any federal transit funds, any federal highway funds in the in the metropolitan planning area. Uh, as a result of the 2000 census, the population changed. It was necessary to expand the area. We have some more communities involved now. and. PACS is giving every community the opportunity to redefine its boundaries. Uh, the only area of Cape Elizabeth that's not, man that's not mandatory to be included in the PACS area is ironically much the same <laughs> section that uh, mm -hmm. cellular coverage doesn't provide for that U.S. Cellular was roughly telling us about. It's that outer part of uh, uh, Route 77 uh, extending uh, beyond uh, Kettle Cove Road. And because uh, it's not heavily traveled. Because it's not heavily <laughs> No, because it's not well populated. It's, right, a, it's yeah. a population issue. Yeah. Uh, however, for, <laughs> for purposes of, of planning, consistency, whatever, uh, all the staff members have discussed this, the PAC staff has discussed this, and we all agree that it's in uh, everyone's best interest for Cape Elizabeth to remain, uh, to keep its entire geographic area within the PAC area. Okay. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Five, six, seven in favor. <laughs> Item 100 is a request from Verizon to approve a pole location on Penny Lane. I think it's very appropriate. It was <laughs> Penny Lane on the 40th anniversary of the Beatles. I have the song with me if you'd okay. like to hear it. Uh, <laughs> All right. Um, so <laughs> I'll start over again. A request to approve a poll location on Penny Lane 
um, approximately 130 feet southerly of Gladys Road. And there's uh, a package. Do you have any comments on this, Michael? No. I recommend its approval. Okay. So I hear a motion. I don't, I don't want to make the meeting any longer, but well, I'm, I'm. Let's have a motion first oh. before we have a discussion. So moved. Second. Okay. Thank you, Councillor Fritz. I just had a question. Um, is the poll to provide service just to Penny Lane, or is it going to a new subdivision? It, at this point, it's just for a single home on, on Penny Lane, but potentially uh, it could provide additional service to uh, future growth in that area. Okay. Any further discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Seven. Someday I'd like to get to the point where we have underground utilities, but I guess that's another day. Um, it's far more than one coal will need to be <laughs> relocated. Next place to start, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, the next item is item 101. Um, this is a recommendation from the town manager recommending an alewife harvesting plan. And, uh, and I'm laughing only to, to explain to the public, <laughs> we've had alewives before us for about six months, but it looks like tonight we will resolve it. Mr. McGovern. Yes, yeah, thank you, Madam Chairman. I spoke with Jody Jordan about this, and he, he does have one concern with it. Let me just pass that along. If you look at the proposed regulations in the third paragraph, it provides that during the closed season, a minimum size unobstructed op opening of three feet by three feet shall be maintained in the upstream and downstream end of the trap to allow for the escapement of spawning alewives and other migratory fish. You know, this is during the closed season. There is no trap in place. And the issue is, is can we get three feet by three feet? This is within the standard state guideline that it's three feet by three feet. It is not our intent to uh, interfere with the natural environment, mm -hmm. uh, to create a larger uh, uh, area where the trap, you know, otherwise would be. It makes no sense because we can't do three feet the whole way. So our intent would be not to uh, to uh, destroy the environment in this region and to leave this to the the good uh, decision-making powers of the experts at the Department of Marine Resources to bring this matter to their attention and to let them uh, uh, share with us their views on it. Should we just strike out the three feet by three feet? I, I debated doing since that. We, since we, we can't do that size and we can have an ordinance and Uh, I was thinking, title. during the closed season, a, an unobstructed opening shall be maintained. Unobstructed natural opening. How's that? Works for me. Question on that. If the beavers block it up, or tree falls, whose responsibility is it going to be to keep it open? Uh, I'll direct that question to <laughs> the town manager, not being an expert on AOI. Uh, this policy is silent on what beavers do. <laughs> uh, your, your question specifically, if the beavers knock down the... If they close... If they, I don't, you know, if they did this in the area of the trap, you know, I think we, we would deal with that. But you know, it's not our intent to interfere with the, the natural habitat of, of the beavers. Uh, further up in the Great Pond. Uh, they tend to populate the area uh, where Alewise Coal, Alewise Brook uh, uh, meets Great Pond. Yeah, yeah. uh, our intent is not to uh, interfere with the, the natural habitat of the people. I'm not sure that answered the question, but the Alewise <laughs> can't run at the block, and I, I don't think sure he knows the I want to make sure that's not the town's responsibility. To, to, to have to run down there every week to open it back up. Yeah. I gather that he doesn't know the answer, and we'll let him off the hook. We, we don't intend to do that. Councilman <laughs> Hall. 
I'm sorry, uh, Manager McGovern. Did you say whether um, Mr. Jordan got back to you? He and, did. And it, he said that was the only issue that he raised. Otherwise, he uh, he would look forward to participating in this program. Okay. So we will amend it to strike the C by C reference. Yes, and we instead have uh, during the closed season a minimum. A no, during the closed season, uh, a unobstructed natural opening shall be maintained. Do I need a second on that amendment? Second. Well, I thought I made it. Okay. <laughs> For your minute. Second. Okay. All in favor? The, of the amendment? Of the, the regulation as amended. The amended regulation. Could you read it? Well, Just we've, that paragraph. Do, I'll read the sentence. Yeah. During the closed season, an unobstructed natural opening shall be maintained in the upstream and downstream end of the track to allow for escapement of spawning alewives Etc. Councillor Backer. Are, are we still on the comment stage before we vote? Yes. <laughs> I, w I would hate to leave this topic. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Two very small things. <laughs> um, in the last sentence, no one may trespass upon the land of another for the purpose of harvesting alewives except with the permission of the landowner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if, if you have permission, it's not trespass. Can we just change that to say no one may enter rather than trespass? No one, so it reads, no one may enter upon the land of another for the purpose of harvesting alewives without, except with the permission of the landowner. Sounds better, yeah. Um, and second in the paragraph that we were just discussing previously is there such a word as escapement <laughs> that's the word that we took straight from the department of marine resources and i i would not want to ever doubt the judgment of a state official well if it came from augusta i don't think it's a word <laughs> <laughs> can we change that to allow for the escape of spawning alewives and other migratory allow fish for the escape <laughs> Okay. I'm I will sorry, accept sorry it as a Smith. friendly uh, amendment to my uh, amendment. Henceforth, Councilor Backer, we will probably have the model regulation. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you make the language more simple, then more complicated. Okay. Then. All in favor, <laughs> Councilor Mull. <laughs> While we were talking about the last paragraph, yes. Um, just so I get this straight, the town. He, someone that wants to harvest their wives is going to come to the town manager and say, can I get a town permit to harvest their wives? And should he, I mean, just about the whole stream goes up Jody's farm. Should, should you have to make a provision where you have the landowner permission before you come to the town for the permit or, or anything or just leave it? This thing is drafted, if I might not understand yes, this. Man. This thing is drafted in such a way that it that it it, it really gives the owner of Alewife Farm, Jody Jordan, the exclusive right to be the harvester <laughs> of these. He is both a commercial fisherman, he's a he's a he's South Bait. He, he's the guy, if you want to get Alewife or, or get bait, he's the guy to go to. Uh, and he's also the major landowner. So it was, it was written in such a way without saying that Jody Jordan shall be harvester <laughs> to provide that uh, okay. he definite may preference would be given to, to uh, categories that he appears to fit. Okay. I'm Is there if we move the question? Right. And that's non-debatable, so. All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. Fish, I want to thank the ordinance committee, and I want to thank most of all the manager, who has become an expert on alewives. I'm sure something that probably in graduate school you never. Yeah. In, in all in all seriousness, you know, I think there are some issues with with whether or not this program might or might not be successful because of the the lack of depth in alewives uh, work 
and you know, before allow, giving anyone a permit, you know, I'm going to be darn sure that that it is environmentally appropriate for, mm -hmm. for these species. That you know, the last thing we would want is to have a bunch of alewives get halfway up the brook and uh, have reach an unfortunate uh, demise. demise. So, you know, I, I want to you know, we've kidded about this a lot, but I want to I want to uh, to assure the public and the council that this will be done sensitively with with full respect for the species. Thank you. Okay. The next item is a request in, in our agenda. Item 102 is a request from a citizen to prohibit the parking of certain trucks within the residential area and subdivisions unless coincident with necessary services such as construction or delivery of goods. And essentially, um, a citizen has written to the town council to ask that the town council consider an ordinance banning uh, large tractor trailer type trucks and the cab. Um, so we need to decide whether we want to refer this to a committee or do something about it. And Councillor Swift Teada. I would move that we refer this to the ordinance committee. Second. Any further discussion? Okay. All in favor? Two, four, five, six, seven in favor of sending it to the ordinance committee and I will thank the ordinance committee in advance on on handling this. The ordinance committee has been extremely busy this year. Okay, item, uh, I'm sorry, at this point is uh, the time for citizens discussion of items not on the agenda. Since uh, there are no citizens left here except for Deborah Lane. You are a citizen, I play I said except for Deborah Lane and all of us, but we've had a, the mic all night. Um, I anticipate that there will be none, so we will move to item 103. Which well, I did hear out of one ear that there was one unresolved question at the end of the alewife ordinance issue. What's the penalty if someone violates the alewife ordinance? It, it would be, I, I'm not, I'm not an expert on this yet, and my assumption would be that it would uh, that there are I think there are there are state, state laws. statutes fishing game yes, laws. in there are. fishing game laws yes, that there would, are. would deal with that. I'm not familiar with yeah. what those penalties are. No, I think there are. That was my okay. Opinion. Our next item on the agenda is uh, a request to enter into executive session to complete the annual evaluation of the town manager. Um, do we need to? I would like to. Okay. I, I think we just need to sort of roll up all the comments and it shouldn't take more than five minutes. So can I have a motion? I don't anticipate that we will take any action in that. Hold off one second, please, Michael. I don't anticipate that we will take any action in that executive session. If we do take any action, we will come out of the executive session, come back and have a meeting in public on that, although uh, I don't think the television will join us at that point. I also, before we go into executive session, just want to uh, announce one more time that we do have a council workshop on um, February 12th at 7.30 to um, discuss a number of things, including um, Conservation Commission access to Great Pond. So, um, and after the executive session, we are going to go into a meeting, a public meeting, as um, in our role as trustees for the museum at Portland Headlight. So um, that will be the rest of our business for the rest of this evening. Councillor Mould. Yes, may I make a motion yes. that we enter executive session to complete the annual evaluation of the town manager? You may make that motion. Do I have a second? All in favor? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Thank you. 